Okay. okay. Um, so here's the first case for today. So 29 month female bilateral infantile tibia vera. So we see this kind of like hooked processes along the inner metaphyses of the bilateral tibias. Yep. Uh, so I think this is Blount's disease, correct? Right, right. And so, that's where you get like a premature closure. And so they get abnormal growth and you get tibia vera. Yeah, typically with MR, I don't actually see closure so much. I think, but or maybe asymmetric closure yeah, or something. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a uh, increased growth in this particular area. Maybe, maybe from trauma. Uh, uh, it has, you know, other names. Uh, and when it happens early, it usually is very reversible. Uh, when it's later, it, it becomes a little bit more of a problem. Uh, and uh, which we can see here, it usually. Early in life, it respond, usually completely resorbs. There is a classification of different abnormalities and injuries to that medial growth plate, uh, which have been described, some of which are probably post-traumatic, uh, more severe. Uh, and you get, get a lot of edema, delayed ossification in the growth plate. And then, as you said, you can get bony bridging. Uh, and then here are just some other examples of Blount's disease uh, in these kids. John, do you want to comment on this? Uh, the main thing about Blount's disease is, um, in my experience, uh, I've seen quite a few cases um, before MRI. I, I never had a chance to look at them on MRI um, on a prolonged basis. And um, one thing about Blount's is it's usually unilateral. It's not bilateral. Uh, bilateral is usually physiological bowling, and that's the most common uh, thing that we see. Um, a lot of kids get treated for physiological bowling, which is kind of silly, um, but uh, it took a while for uh, uh, folks to realize that. Um, the thing about blouse is what you do is you, you do osteotomies on, on, uh, and, and try to straighten the bone. Uh, and you do open wedge osteotomies. Um, in other words, you just put the, the distal part of the, well, the, 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 the leg part um, into the valgus position and open it um, medially. And that um, straightens um, the knee. And then you have to repeat that uh, on a, on a regular basis. Now, I think they're starting to work on the physis, um, but I'm not sure how far they've gotten to that. I, I haven't got to that part in a new Campbell's, so I'm going to have to do a reading on that. Okay, thanks, John. Yeah, so. um, well, it, one thing um, to add, um, it can be pretty bad news. Yeah. So it's it, it's a condition that uh, you don't want to see uh, uh, um, uh, very often. Right. If ever, I, I I never liked it because of many operations. Right. Okay. Uh, Ashley, what do you think of this case? So this patient's a seven-year-old male with a pyphysial fracture. Follow-up. Um, so looking here, we can see that there's some, it looks like some osseous bridging of the epiphysis uh, of the distal femur. Um, I, I think this is uh, concerning for, for um, uh, yeah, there's, there's a bony bridge there, and, and you probably will get uh, 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 asymmetric growth um, on that side. Uh, not not, not oh, sure. necessarily. What you do with these is uh, you would, uh, go in and, and open up, uh, take take out the bridge, uh, put in uh, 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 fat from the buttocks, and uh, they'll open and then stay open. Um, one thing you you may get is um, overgrowth. Um, and that's a possible thing. Um, these don't work 100%, but if they don't work, Early on, after you do the surgery, you repeat it. Uh, usually, these turn out pretty well. 
Uh, if, the, uh, if the entire growth phase closes, then of course you've got problems. Then you have to start lengthening at the leg and try to uh, let it catch up to the other one. I think the le lengthening this, I remember, is no wonder two, two inches. If you want to hear an interesting story, I can tell you one, but uh, if, only if you have the time. Go ahead, John. What, hap what, what happened to a young lady that I was uh, opening up? I, I mean, I was lengthening the leg on. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I started lengthening a leg on a 15-year-old girl. And um, I got to, um, she was uh, minus two and a half inches. I got to one and a half inches plus, and um, uh, I had the instruments in and so on, and it was healing nicely and it was going straight. Um, uh, and uh, she, of course, was in the hospital. That's what, what she, we used to do. I don't know whether you still do that or not, but. Uh, she was in the hospital, and then we had to stop. Well, her boyfriend used to visit her without the nurses being present. She got pregnant. And so because we couldn't take any more x-rays, we couldn't continue lengthening. Oh, my God. And so, yep, we stopped and uh, let it. Uh, so she, instead of having a normal leg, basically, uh, she wound out with uh, with an inch plus um, short leg. Oh my gosh! Wow. Uh, so that that was an interesting situation. Okay. Okay, Michael, what do you think of this one? All right, now nine-year-old gymnast fall from bars. Have some arrows. Um, so it looks like we probably have a, uh, uh, you know, Salter Harris type fracture, pivotal fracture with periosteal stripping, and the periosteum, you know, flaps into the growth plate, so it's like trapped periosteum. Yeah, kind of like we talked about before. Mm -hmm. Here's a here's a similar case in the in the tibia, but I. So and then this is this is from uh, James Linklater in. Uh, in uh, Denver, a little bit like what we talked about before. Um, he, he's right in a certain way, but uh, like I said, um, if you have a bar and you remove it and you put fat in, in there, you'll, you'll continue with normal growth. So he, he, he's right in some sense, but I wouldn't use this as a general uh, commentary. Okay. All right, uh, this uh, 52 year old with a two week history of knee pain, uh, Ashu. you. Yeah, so it looks like there's a, a fracture extending through the posterior medial femoral condyle. Um, looks like a, is that a bullet fragment or? Yeah. yeah. So he was trying to play quick draw McGraw and he pulled the trigger before he pulled out the gun. And that's what happened. Okay, wow. Michael. All right, 56 year old male pain after fall. So you can see that there's a oblique fracture through the distal, like femoral metadiaphysis with posterior displacement and angulation. I'm not sure what all this metallic artifact or this dark signal is. Probably a medullary rod. Oh, like this is post surgery? Okay, yeah. And there's still a pretty significant posterior displacement. Yeah, that's a cute fracture. Is this on top of the rod? Was like they already had the rod and then they... Yeah, this was an, this was an MR scan after the rod was placed. Just showing you... Have oh, no, I, I understand that, John, but was was the rod... All, so, so it was after that rod was placed? Right. The fracture occurred. So is this cancer or what? Oh, uh, no, my, my understanding is he fell, fractured the, the, the femur, they put a rod in, and then they got an MR scan. Oh, I see. So uh, it, it, uh, why? 
I don't remember why they they got the MR. This just kind of just shows the fracture. Uh, that's uh, they, peculiar. They, they couldn't explain. Uh, I thought maybe this was a um, a rod in there, and, and then he fell on top of it and uh, broke it again, or something of that sort. Uh, you know, that's possible. I don't remember the history here. That that could that could be the case. I don't remember. Yeah, it's been pretty unusual. Well, you know better than I that pretty unusual to get an MRI um, post op. Yeah. You get X rays. Yeah. So we can go into kind of chronic injuries. We've already talked about osteochondral injuries here. We saw this case before, so we don't need to do this. Oh, here's a here's a case. This was a teenage soccer player who had intermittent pain in the knees for uh, several years. Uh, let's see, whose turn is it? I think it's mine. Okay. Um, intermittent pain in the knees. Honestly, I. I don't really see much here. Yeah, there's really not much to see. There's a little thing here, and there's a little thing over here. Okay. And then here's the CT. Wow, is that? It looks like calcification along the, uh, the lateral aspects of the proximal femur, and I don't know if that's like a displaced chondral fragment that is calcified or. Yeah, and then uh, these were thought to be just growth irregularities. Uh, here, then we got an MR scan, and this is what the MR scan showed. So that's wow. Uh, well, you can see these are actually osteochondral, bilateral osteochondral fractures, and that that calcification that you saw is actually the subchondral bone that's displaced into the joint space uh, bilaterally. Wow. Well, that one uh, knee um, on X-ray looked osteoporotic is that or osteopenic I think that's just grid cut off I think that's a oh, is that? oh, okay yeah well it, it, that's an orthopedic opinion you know <laughs> okay Michael what do you think of this one 12 year old with knee pain giving out and positive black men uh, um, John, do you want to tell us what a Lachman is? A Lachman, I think I already uh, talked about it, but uh, it's the same thing as um, anterior posterior drawer, except it's done with a knee at 30 degrees of flexion instead of 90 degrees. Thanks. And Thanks. All, all you do is just take the tibia approximately and try to lift it up uh, away from the femur anteriorly uh, with the knee at 30 degrees while you're sitting on a foot. Um, it, it, I think the anterior drawer is more accurate, frankly, but uh, to each his own, I guess. Um, a Lachman test in a 12-year-old is meaningless. Um, a Lachman test um, is probably positive on the other side, too. It's, it's usually they're bilateral, and it's very, very common in a 12-year-old. Thank you. So, Michael, what do you think of this case? And with that information, I guess we see um, it's probably like a subchondral fracture involving that, uh, yeah, the femoral condyle right there. Because I think the ACL looks what we can see it is intact. So this is 1706. Yeah, and the cartilage looks over intact. Um, same so, date? Yeah, same date. So here, we're, as you said, uh, what we have are these subchondral injuries. The uh, overlying articular cartilage is still intact because it's much more pliable uh, due to mm -hmm. direct trauma. So this is six, seven fourteen oh six. This is uh, a few years later. Okay, so now we see that there's fluid undercutting a separated uh, osteochondral fragment with significant surrounding edema. So this would be like an unstable subchondral or osteochondral defect. But the cartilage overall looks. Maybe he's holding it in place. Yeah. So you can just see how these progress over time. Uh, do you think this kid was behaving himself? Uh, no. If he was my patient, he would have been in a cast, and the parents would have got a real tongue lashing. Uh, this kid obviously is probably a, an athletic kind of a 
whatever um, sport he's in and, and the parents are kind of probably pushing him on or not paying attention to him at all. Uh, th th this shouldn't happen. And then here, so osteochondritis desiccans really are subchondral fractures, we now know. Uh, there were a lot of theories as to what they were in the past, but with MR, it's clear that these are fractures, and we followed a bunch of them as we just, that one, and they're, they're really all, all due to trauma. Repetitive. Repetitive trauma, that's right. And, and the, the other thing also is that they're, uh, they, they still keep talking about um, vascular problems. Right. And I, I don't think the vascularity really is a... Uh, it's up in the air, John, okay. in orthopedic literature. All right. All right. And here we can see an example really of a more chronic uh, non-union type where you have sclerotic rims on both sides. And actually, usually with these, there is uh, there's a little bit of fluid that will go into the uh, the joints, the, the space bet, uh, between the fragment and the underlying bone, uh, typical. Uh, and, and more severe. And this, this, this one you can pin, pin back, yeah. and uh, yeah. that, 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 they work pretty well. And it doesn't look like it's the form, and the cartilage looks, cartilage yeah. looks pretty good. Yep. So I would just um, pin it back. Yeah. And here's a more uh, a larger one with more of a comminuted uh, subchondral fractures here. Again, uh, just uh, different appearances of what we used to call the osteochondritis. What did I see in the, uh, did you, what is going on with the patella there? Or Here? Yeah, is that uh, something going on over there on the, on the left there? image? And, uh, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I just kind of caught my eye. Yeah, we're just kind of obliquely cutting the patella. I'm not sure. We'd have to look at the other images. Yeah. So th this is just a more severe, a larger example of the, of the same lesion. Uh, well, here again, it's uh, uh, repetitive trauma and, 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 and lack of behavior. Good behavior. Here's a much more chronic lesion where we can see the, uh, the kind of unstable fragment fluid going deep into the defect. Uh, so this is this is a very large uh, osteochondral defect. In this case, uh, uh, people are now trying to treat a lot of these with uh, with uh, grafts placement replacements or or a unit, unit compartment need, depending upon the age. Okay. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this case? Um, I'm just looking here. It says osteochondral injury. I'm looking at the lateral uh, femoral condyle there. If there's some irregularity and some lucency there and some sclerosis around the borders. Um, you can see the posterior lateral femoral condyle here on the MRI. There's osteochondral injury. It looks like there may, may be some fissuring, but overall the cartilage looks intact, um, and there's no fluid interdigitating, no cystic change, and not much bone marrow edema. Great. So that was an acute injury. Again, these subchondral injuries where the overlying cartilage is, is still intact. Michael, what do you think is going on here? Uh, it looks like there's depressed fracture of that uh, tibial plateau, and there's probably an acute injury of that adjacent meniscus. Oh, and if this is chronic or acute? Yeah. Um, can we go? Can we go back to that prior one? I mean, there's a, there's quite a bit of edema, so and also surrounding edema, so I guess it's somewhat acute. Yeah, but uh, on the T1, notice how sharply defined it is. Yeah. And okay. This and this this was a, a chronic impacted fracture, uh, tear of the middle that, meniscus, and uh, there's was. No, I'm sorry, John. There's also a kissing lesion on the femur, and the torn meniscus. Yeah, and the torn meniscus. So uh, he, 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 uh, it's. 
chronic, I would think. Uh, but then I have no business saying that. That's well, I do, but uh, that's only because I learned from you, John. Yeah, <laughs> sir. And then, but uh, remember, you can get acute edema. This kind of pattern uh, is kind of more uniform. You don't have the kind of streaks that you get in acute kind of edema, and this is more of a chronic granulation tissue look to it. But but I would be concerned about whether this could have an acute on top of chronic component just on the fat suppressed. But when we go to the non-fat suppressed, this is really a, a chronic appearance with relatively well-defined margins. Okay. Is this a, a, a elderly woman, or what, what? What are we dealing with here? I think it's a female knee. Uh, I don't know. You may okay, know. because that, that, that might have collapsed on its own due to osteoporosis. Possibly. I've seen that. Yeah. Um, so more than pretty, once. Pretty good trabecular bone here, but it, that may be the case. I don't remember the history in detail, John. Oh. Okay. okay, thank you. Yep. Ashu, what do you think is going on here? Um, okay, so we're looking at two sagittal images um, of the lateral compartment. I don't really see much. There's some thinning of the cartilage uh, in the anterior zone. Yeah, but that's a common location for normal. Yeah. Yeah, I don't really see my. Okay, now we see a. Okay. 2404, 52404. So we're just a few months later. Well, now you have um, a pretty extensive osteochondral injury. And I think there's actually complete delamination of that uh, cartilage posteriorly. And there's uh, evidence of depression of the subchondral bone plate there. Uh, well, the subchondral bone. Is um, delaminated. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And then here you can see a loose body anteriorly. And uh, this was this was an osteochondral injury. The patient's symptoms first started at this time when everything looked fine, but uh, obviously progressed fairly rapidly to this. Was there a meniscal tear there? It looked like there might be a start of a meniscal tear, but I don't know. Probably on the first image. Yeah. It sure looks like it. There's a little bit of fraying of the edge there, maybe. Well, on the AP view, though, it sure looks. And there's some blunting, too. Is that the same case? This, this case and this are the same case. Yeah. And this. Okay. Uh, See, Michael, what do you think of this case? Well, there's a there's a fracture through that uh, lateral anterior part of the lateral femoral condyle. Okay. It's kind of minimally displaced. Um, I think the cartilage looks relatively spared. It's kind of a subchondral type fracture. Yeah. So this is kind of an impacted fracture by mechanism. So it's really a subchondral fracture. And uh, this is one that will heal pretty nicely if you allow it to heal and not not impact the the injury. Was this acute dislocation, John? Was it a what? Acute dislocation of the patella. No, I think I think this was a fall on the knee. Uh, oh, a direct blow. Direct blow. Yeah. Okay. So this is a patient who came in with a diagnosis of spontaneous osteonecrosis, uh, which was a term that was used a lot a number of years ago. Uh, Ashu, what do you think of this one? Honestly, it looks more like, I don't know, it looks like a fracture on the T1s. Um, it looks like there's extensive bone marrow edema, subchondral bone marrow edema that extends through the... Uh, yeah. Through the medial aspect of the of the tibia there. Yeah. So spontaneous osteoporosis typically occurred in kind of older women, uh, the kind of group that John was just talking about, who tend to be osteoporotic. And here you can see that the trabecular bone is pretty faint here. This is really all fat. So this patient, and you don't see really any trabecular bone on the stirs. So this is a patient who probably does have osteoporosis. And uh, uh, and you can see that there's a little depression of the 
uh, tibial plateau here, and uh, this is really a fracture line across here. Across here. So I, I think what we used to call spontaneous osteonecrosis, now I'm really quite convinced, are really uh, uh, fractures usually associated with osteoporosis, and they're really insufficiency fractures. I, I never call them uh, that. I always call them a fracture. Um, if you look at the fat around there, uh, this woman is probably grossly overweight. Yeah. And she probably doesn't move very much. Right. And I think that uh, she does have osteonecrosis, uh, as, as you, you mentioned, John. I said. Yeah. It doesn't look like there's a bunch of bone around there. Right. And uh, these are all cases which in the past would have been called spontaneous osteonecrosis, and I think these are really all insufficiency fractures. And then here we can see this is this is a uh, transient dislocation of the patella. We've talked about these before. We get edema in the lateral femoral condyle anteriorly. Uh, I used to call them compression fractures. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that sounds good. All right, uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? I'm looking. Um, so I see, I see that there's increased, you know, fluid signal along the uh, epiphysis of the medial, uh, you know, the distal femur. The epiphysis uh, down here? I mean, like the physeal plate. You mean up here? Yep. Yeah, that's probably more metaphyseal here. Okay, that's fine. And then we can see that this is that same area back here. Yeah, and so. What's going on here? It looks like there's kind of maybe like separation of that posterior periosteum. Like, I don't know if this is just some. Uh, Fracture. Oh, that's just cortical desmoid. Okay. So this is called a cortical desmoid, and I think these are chronic traction injuries at the gastrocnemius origin here, uh, from the posterior distal metaphysis of the femur, and you get these uh, chronic traction injuries, and sometimes you can get a lot of hypertrophic bone formation here, and there have been some. Uh, that's uh, it looks like the gas truck is going right at it yeah right and so these are called cortical desmoids it's important you guys have uh, obviously have heard about these these are important to differentiate because i know of a of a couple of cases one of which was uh from a very famous person who, who these were operated on and the pathology was called a neoplasm and they did an amputation uh, and, and I used the name, John? Uh, no. No? No. Uh, so, okay. So it, it's important and it's best to differentiate these by imaging. This is really at this location, if, you, if it just looks like it's a traction injury uh, to the bone, uh, uh, this, this is a classic cortical desmoid seen in teenagers. And uh, if it just, if it has an, the, the standard symptoms, I, I, if we get it in, if we go forward into bone tumors, I'll show some actual bone tumors in this location. So you can get bone tumors in this location, uh, but they really look very differently than this. Uh, this is just, a t it looks like really a traction injury to the cortical and subcortical sub bone here at the insertion of the gastrox. And, and this is just a chronic traction injury typically called cortical desmoids in this location. They're kind of leave-me-alone lesions. Uh, if you biopsy them and people aren't really familiar with these, they can diagnose uh, malignant uh, tumors. And as I said, I know of at least one case, a couple of them I think also, uh, where the, the child ended up having an amputation uh, for this. Uh, as I remember, was MRI available then? No, the, the, the one that I think I don't, about, John, was... was I think all we had was x-rays. Yeah, and, and but the diagnosis, uh, there was a well-known visiting musculoskeletal radiologist who went to a well-known uh, imaging center, and they were showing him uh, uh, cases, unknown cases, and he diagnosed a cortical desmoid. They came back saying that it was a, 
a tumor. And he said, no, it's not a tumor. What did you do with the patient? And they said, well, earlier this morning, we amputated the, the leg. And so it was uh, uh, a big deal. But uh, uh, to just be aware of uh, cortical desmoid in, in this location. Okay, and then we can also see some injuries around the foot and foot and ankle. Here's a little feceal injury uh, here, the distal fibula, uh, medial malleal injury with uh, with trauma uh, here. Uh, <clears throat> this patient just has multiple injuries. In in the foot and ankle, the, the navicular is a common bone to be uh, injured with trauma, so you always have to look carefully at that uh, whenever you have foot trauma. And then you're all familiar with Charcot's disease. We've already seen quite a few of these. Uh, typically, what we see with Charcot disease is multiple uh, joint spaces are, are involved. You can have kind of diffuse uh, in abnormal signal intensity within the bone compounded with granulation tissue, but you, then you, you'll have these sharply demarcated, demarcated areas of low signal intensity, often with uh, cystic areas inside of them in multiple locations, and you see sharp planes within these. If you have osteomyelitis, you will not see sharp planes like this uh, within the bone. Uh, and again, this is a very characteristic chronic degenerative pattern from repetitive trauma seen in charcoal disease with the low signal intensity here. Uh, these lesions are characteristically not, and even though you see a lot of uh, increased signal intensity uh, compatible with edema, in this case granulation tissue within the bones, this is not a typical appearance for osteomyelitis, because what you'll use MR for in Charcot's disease is to differentiate between just repetitive chronic trauma and osteomyelitis. And this is a typical appearance of non-infected Charcot uh, degenerative disease. Other examples also showing uh, the same degenerative changes typical of Charcot's. The diabetic foot is a little bit differently. Uh, <clears throat> Typically, with a diabetic foot, you'll get an infection. Uh, soft tissue abscesses are very common, as we see here, uh, very nicely demarcated with, with contrast. Now, there's a concern about the use of contrast in diabetics and people with renal failure in the past. Uh, we no longer believe that the modern gadolinium agents uh, put uh, patients with renal failure at risk, so we typically don't even ask for the renal function anymore. And even if the patient uh, does not have good renal function uh, will give contrast. Uh, for the diabetic foot, I think it's important because you want to pick up these abscesses because these typically, if you're not going to amputate, these need to be drained. If you don't drain them, then it's very hard to, uh, uh, to get rid of the infection. Here's a more severe case. Again, the, the patients get these because they do not have a good sense of sensation of the foot. <coughs> Uh, because of neuropathic disease, so they can do a lot of damage without recognizing it. Uh, and here's another case of severe Charcot disease with distress of the ankle joint. Amputations are not uncommon in these. Right. And there, the important thing when they get infected like this is you have to determine where the proximal end of the infection is. And the biggest problem that people have is that when they get infected, you get all this soft tissue infection, it gets into the tendons and it can track proximally up through the tendons. And then if you just amputate where the bone is infected without treating the infection in the tendon, then the patients will come back six months to a year later with osteomyelitis more proximal and you just keep chopping off the leg. Uh, from distal more proximally. So you, you have to be very careful with MR uh, to make sure you, you image proximally enough to get the full extent of the soft tissue infection. Uh, um, uh, almost all of these, um, uh, John, are below the knee amputations. Okay. And, and, and uh, if that gets infected, then you go above the knee. Yeah. And, that, and, and then, then, you, then it's almost curtains. Yeah. Uh, that's if it's around the ankle, but when distally in the foot, <coughs> often they'll amputate toes or or just at the transmitter tarsal area. Yeah, you you amputate um, what's black, but but uh, that's not what we're talking about uh, with this case. This, oh, this case. This case, you know, you go below the knee at least. Right. right. Yeah. Okay. Why don't we move to 
to causes of heel pain. Here we can see this is a T1 weighted image on a low field scanner, a stir on a low field scanner. The T1 looks pretty normal. The stir shows a lot of uh, edema within the calcaneus. We all know that stir is more sensitive for uh, trabecular bone injuries. Uh, here is a Taylor Dome injury. Uh, this is a very early MR scans back before we even had stir sequences. Here we can see a lot of signal loss on the T1-weighted images compatible with edema. Uh, following it over time, over uh, six weeks, we can see that most of the edema is resolved and we just have a little focal area uh, where the bone is still healing uh, in this patient. Uh, here's a typical Taylor Dome injury. These are commonly seen, as you know, with inversion injuries of the ankle. And we can see that the mortis joint is not normal here. Uh, we have instability of the ankle and this chronic uh, uh, subchondral uh, cystic change here due to uh, uh, impaction injury. This thing, when it gets more severe, and we'll talk, we'll talk about a grading system for this disease when we get to the to the ankle. Uh, and we can, this is much more severe where we have extensive grade four chondromalacia and these subchondral cystic changes from degenerative disease. Okay. Uh, See, uh, Michael, this was a teenage soccer player with uh, knee pain. Uh, um, okay, see, I don't know if, there, if that's just kind of like the angle, if there's some bony bridging across the physeal plate. Yeah, we don't see it real well there. It looks okay here. Let's see on this side, yeah. A little help. This is what the MR scan shows. Uh, so the MR scan shows some um, increased signal in that distal metaphysis and the adjacent epiphysis with some increased signal within the physeal plate. <laughs> so what are you thinking about as a cause of this? Uh, well, I guess I'm thinking of kind of like maybe like a, if, was it traumatic? Well, there's no, they don't say trauma, but teenage uh, boys get all kinds of trauma, so you certainly yeah. have to can think about trauma. I don't see like a discrete fracture line through the bones. It's like a Salter Harris type fracture. Right. Well, what else would you think about? In the um, I mean, I guess you could have an infection. Okay. They don't have any trauma. And then here's what it looks like on the sagittal images, and this was uh, the, the this was actually called a. Uh, uh, there was no fever, no chills, nothing like that. Mm -hmm. This is called a, uh, a, uh, a a growth plate fracture at that time. The patient was treated conservatively, and the patient came back a year later now with increasing symptoms. So now we kind of have this like focal, almost fluid-like type collection with kind of well-defined borders and surrounding edema. So I'm worried this is like a chronic like Brody's abscess or something. Yeah, this was the development of a Brody's abscess. Here's what it looks like on the sagittal images. So this yeah, and you, is almost and a you can see. So yeah, there's a little fistula tract to posteriorly. Yeah, so this was actually <laughs> staph aureus osteomyelitis. I, I, would you have gone and and then uh, uh, for this as a trauma, John? Uh, you know, I don't remember. This was a this was a, a case from I think around 1990, and I, uh, I I don't remember what we put in the differential, but I, I believe it was uh, thought that it was trauma at that time. I, uh, there, there's a, a, um, increased signal and, and around uh, that central bone uh, on uh, right there uh, that doesn't look like trauma to me i oh, you're I'm, right. I'm sorry it, it wasn't I, trauma. It, it, it wasn't trauma right so you know i i would have thought of uh, infection here i probably would have got some studies and whatever yeah and i certainly wouldn't have waited this long or um, somebody goofed someplace, I think. Yeah, and I forgot the details of what happened. He was kind of lost to follow up, and uh, and then came back a year later, and this is what it was. And his blood cultures were all negative, but an aspirate. Uh, well, they, 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 they can be negative, and on the, uh, quite frequently, Brody's abscess, um, you don't get much of anything other than. Uh, um, 
what, what, what is that study? Uh, um, it's not just the cell rate will be up, but there's one other CPK, is it, or what? I'm not sure. I don't know. I forgot the name of the study. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, let's see. Who's whoever's ne who's next? What's what do you think this is? It's almost. Uh, it kind of looks like. <clears throat> I don't know if this is. Is this the distal femur? Could be an enchondroma. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, so this is an enchondroma. These are really old images. Sorry about that. Proton density and T2-weighted images. This is probably from the 1980s, showing a, an enchondroma at that time, versus this pattern. Michael, what do you think this pattern is? Uh, this pattern looks more like a uh, infarct. Yeah, that's that. That's really more infarct or AVN. This is a patient who had uh, lupus. Mm -hmm. and, and they have it bilaterally, or not bilaterally, but in both femoral condo. And here's... Uh, Asher, this patient who came in with acute onset knee pain, an older individual. Okay, it looks like there is uh, definitely increased uh, uptake on the nuclear med scan. Um, uh, we're looking at the tibia here on the left side, and it uh, looks like there is uh, uh, there is uh, areas of uh, heterogeneous uh, kind of signal, increased lucencies, and also some sclerosis a little bit more inferiorly. I think this is also concerning for um, uh, osteonecrosis. Okay, here's the MR scan. Does it look like osteonecrosis on the MR? I, uh, inferiorly, it kind of does, um, but there's a lot of bone marrow edema more superiorly. It kind of looks, doesn't look like typical appearance, but on the on the axials, it could be, yeah. Uh, looks well, like. Uh, now, this does not look like osteonecrosis. I, I have osteonecrosis. Yeah. Well, well, I think in the, the hip lecture, we'll, we'll go through the pathophysiology of what happens with osteonecrosis. There's no double line sign. Right. There's, there's, no, there's no evidence of a uh, reactive interface here. So, right. So, and this was a low-grade chondrosarcoma. Uh, so, uh, you know, this really doesn't look so much like trauma here. <laughs> Increased uptake on bone scan can be anything. Uh, th this really uh, has the appearance very sharp margins here. Uh, uh, that, that, that would worry the hell out of me. This is this really doesn't look like any of the traumatic lesions that we've talked about so far. It doesn't have a double line sign, so this is the kind of lesion that would have to be put in the high risk category. Uh, we'll have a lecture on bone tumors. Uh, where we'll talk more about this and go through the different kinds. This is a, well, this was a low-grade chondrosarcoma. Okay, uh, let's see, Michael, this is a new mass four months after the patient had a fracture of the uh, humerus. Okay, so uh, on T1 axial images, looks like we can see the fracture and there's just kind of nonspecific kind of surrounding soft tissue infiltration. And now is that a is that T1 post contrast on the left? Uh, I think this is I think this is just T1, and then this is a stir sequence here. Okay. Um, well, it sure doesn't look like callus, does it? Yeah. No. Yeah. Here's the bone there. This is where the fracture was, and then you've got this big thing here. Yeah. This stuff. So I'm not really sure. It doesn't look like it has like a I don't see like calcification or anything to be What's like this heter right here. What's this right here? This little speckled signal here that goes all the way up and down on the sides. This can be artifact. What kind of artifact? No, no, a vascular uh, situation, isn't it, John? Right. This is flow art. Ar arter art arterial arterial flow artifact. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what do you think yep. it might be, Michael? I guess they could have like a, like you said, like some sort of like AV malformation type or AV fistula type post trauma. Yeah, and see see all this flow artifact coming yeah. in the phase encoded direction. So this was a pseudoaneurysm uh, due to the due to the fracture. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Ashley, this is another patient who had a fracture. What's going on here? 
So here you can see a fracture of the proximal humerus, but there is extensive, pretty extensive soft tissue replacement. Um, uh, yeah, on the T1s and T2s, pretty heterogeneous. So I would be worried about a pathologic fracture in another yeah. lying mass. Osteosarc. Yeah, this was osteosarc with a pathologic fracture. Good. And here are other examples where the see the tumor extending beyond the cortex and destroying the cortex. Okay. So this patient has had a hip dislocation with an injury and edema that we can see here in the in the proximal femur. Okay. Uh, here's a patient with anterior chest pain. Michael, what do you think of this? Uh, well, this is going to be, I guess, that Sappho syndrome that you already wrote out. So they've got, uh, so this is like through the upper sternum, and it's pretty sclerotic and irregular. And you get, um, you get like synovitis and destructive degenerative changes at the acromioclavicular joints. Yeah. Good. Sappho. Okay, uh, Ashu. Oh, so it's a 19-year-old male with uh, uh, GSD type 1B for 17 years. Uh, looking at this, see uh, looking at, bone yeah, you have, appearance. is it bone on bone or a bone within bone kind of appearance, like a double vertebral body? And looking at, okay, bone within the bone, classic glycosid storage disease. Yeah, okay. through all of these. Hip and back pain. Uh, Michael, what do you think of this case? Um, well, we can see in the, they're 39 year old and in the foot, they've got all this marked kind of hypertrophic degenerative changes of the ankle joint, subtalar, tarsals, um, and then back and hip pain. They also have marked degenerative changes of the bilateral hips that we can see as well, you can see some on the right. So, huh, that's not a normal looking spine. Um, so there's like multiple like in plate irregularities uh, throughout the entirety of the visualized thoracic and lumbar spines. And there's a big posterior disc herniation extrusion um, causing, I've never heard of nice dysplasia. Con congenital dysplasia. So I just put it in the category. Genital. Welcome to the hit uh, uh, to the club. <coughs> no, I've never heard. Yeah, you don't need to. Yes, yeah, it's, it's it's a little futile to memorize all these different dysplasias because now with uh, typing them according to genetic analysis, they're just innumerable ones. Every every. I thought I've I thought I've seen them all, but I don't remember seeing this. And then and the now that they're really being classified concerning the, uh, again, the, uh, the, the genetic differences. Uh, and uh, this, so the, the actual way to characterize these is becoming much more complicated. Uh, and then so they have all different, different collagen. They all, they can all present fairly similarly, but uh, uh, they're just many different different uh, genetic uh, uh, changes which kind of cause these, Horler Danlos, uh, Alpha's disease, notice that. Some of these uh, names have changed over the years too. Yeah. I think there's a lot of, there's been a lot of splitting yeah. uh, because of the um, genetic um, knowledge that we have. Right, exactly. All right, well, uh, why don't we stop here, and John will go on to the elbow next week, okay? It, it, uh, I'm already forgetting all I learned, John. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll remember it by Monday. <laughs> I'll try. Listen, you guys have a great weekend, okay? Okay, same you too. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.